You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button on our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for January 22nd, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the world headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where we hear the presidential diet Pepsi button in the Oval Office has been replaced with a presidential fuck you button. It's the professional left with Drift Class at Blue Gal. I think it was Diet Coke. I don't Not care. Pepsi, but you know, whatever it was, it came on a silver platter when he pushed a red button on See, his desk. Look, look, look what I can do. I push a button, they bring me some beverage. I have a two scoops button, but you can't see it. <laughs> that's under the desk. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's what it's called the panic button, sir. And really, you don't you shouldn't push that just for ice cream. Uh, okay, whatever. You know, Air Force idiots. And he's gone now. So <laughs> and he's gone now. So I think it's the most important thing we can do is forget it ever happened. No, everyone no, involved, no not, I, it, as as my colleague Carolee said, it is my life's work to make sure never, ever does anyone forget that the Republican Party inflicted the past four years on us. Mm-hmm. I, I I predict, mm-hmm. I predict Kaylee McEnany or mm-hmm. one of them, one maybe maybe uh, a Huckabee mm-hmm. uh, will have a show on CNN or um, perhaps MSNBC where she will say in. Six years time, five years time, three years time. My former boss, whatever you thought of him, <laughs> and everyone will just go. Yeah. Well, you know, it was a long time ago, and you know we're alive, and we didn't get fucked over too badly. So I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, and I it, don't think that's how it's going to turn out. I hope, but I hope we'll you're right. see. I, you know, hope springs eternal. You know, I, and you know, I've been thinking a lot this week about Michelle Obama because she was at the inaugural, and yeah. Her hair and outfit and everything made such a splash, and how much she uh, is kind in public to George W. Bush, which yes. puzzles so many of us. You know, we yes. love her. Yes. And um, there's been a lot of uh, images of the transition between Bush and the Obamas, and how the little Obama girls were uh-huh. welcomed into the White House yeah. by the Bush family. Yep. And I can imagine Michelle Obama facing multiple death threats a day, Mm -hmm. moving into the White House from her life as, yes, a senator's wife, but, you know, a first term senator's wife. Right. Not knowing a lot of people in Washington, not being uh, perhaps being a little bit uh, concerned about. I mean, I, I know she had a definite sense of mission. Yes. Uh, for what she wanted to do as first lady, deeply rooted, but yeah, de- and deeply rooted, and yeah. that grounded her. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it still might have felt a little awe inspiring and a little bit uh, nerve wracking to be uh, moving into this position. Yeah, and to be welcomed in and told it's going to be okay, and here's here's some tips on how I handled certain staff issues and did right. things this way and. And let me sh- let my girls show your girls the balcony. Let my girls show your girls the fun they had and the different things they did. Mm-hmm. And this is your home now. And uh, here are the fun things you can do. And just set the family at ease. Yeah. You wouldn't forget that. You um, would not forget that. You know, there's a – I'm, I'm going to make a late season um, – audible call west wing call i'm not going to quote the west wing everybody take a drink but but once jimmy smiths had won you know had yes. won, won the white house he, his wife mm-hmm. he and his wife lovely wife a blonde hot wife who's you know very professional and very thoughtful uh, but she's not ready yeah and and yeah. uh and suddenly he's going to be the president and it, it's a staffing issue. I would like you to come down and meet the staff and, you know, decide in the, who stays and who goes and whatnot, whatnot. And she's thinking, oh, a babysitter and a nanny and, you know, another nanny and maybe somebody. You know, we can pare that down a little bit. And she comes in and there's 50 people there. Yeah. Or maybe 100. Is it? Well, these mm-hmm. are the, this is the main staff. And this is your scheduler. And this is like, oh, crap. I just inherited a corporation. Right. That a giant corporation that runs, that with actually employs directly or indirectly thousands of people. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And my word Mm -hmm. can shift the, the, the alter the lives of all these people. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and she has to really quickly adapt to the, the, and and there's someone there to say, I'm the, basically the head valet or the head butler or the head, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I will guide you through this, but it is not something unless you have been a very wealthy, powerful person with a huge personal staff already. Like Barbara Bush. Like Barbara Bush. Barbara Bush got it right away. Boom. Yep. Um, it would not be in CIA headquarters. She'd done it all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this week, we welcome back an older sponsor of ours for old time's sake. Yeah. Hello, fascist. Oh, they have yeah. a meal kit for Republicans. Hey. I love those guys. <laughs> you know, you cheered over Trump's wall, applauded family separation, and engaged in sedition against the United States of America. Hey, you have legitimate reasons for thinking the restaurant kitchen is peeing in your food. So try Hello Fascist at home meal kit. So try Hello Fascist at home meal kit. It's like they built a wall around your balsamic pork loin. <laughs> you know, that's true. Even though, you know, carry out meals are now necessary for lots of people, that's a lot of what we do now. Um, you know that once they figure out who's calling, they're going to pee in your food. We're just going to. We're going <laughs> to pee in your food. They're definitely going to pee in yeah. your food. You know, that egg drop soup's a little tart. You know why that is? I'll tell you why that is. You deserve it. And, you and deserve so it. The, the, the bonded, <laughs> insured staff at Hello Fascist who film the preparation of your food to guarantee there's very little urine will get into it. Just a minimal Very amount, little. Um, is worth the extra price. And um, I'm, uh, rather than let them starve, they should be able to pay an extraordinary premium amount for you know, basically crappy food with no urine in it. Very little. Very little. Urine. Very little. Minimal mm-hmm. amount. Yeah. Obviously, the inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Yay! Yay! Takes the top spot this week. All the other news pales. We had speeches mentioning white nationalism, white supremacy. We did. Uh, I love the National Mall Remembrance. I did too. Very much. This plague has been going on for a year and been killing people. Now it's 100,000 Benghazis, I like to remind Fox News tweeters. Mm -hmm. And never once did anyone in the Trump administration take a moment to help us grieve. No. Barack Obama, after virtually every school shooting, every mass killing, was out there, you know, holding hands with people and talking to Mm -hmm. people and telling them Mm -hmm. that, you know, this is a terrible thing and crying and singing occasionally and deeply moved by it. Um, And in the Trump administration, you know, grief was weakness. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's you know showing that you're weak. It, what do you? What sort of sissy cries at these sorts of things? And by the way, uh, if we're grieving over it, maybe you're suggesting that something bad happened and we screwed up somehow, and we never made a mistake. We've been perfect all all the way through. So mm-hmm. there, there's nothing to mm-hmm. grieve about because we did everything great. Yeah, and it was just such a tragedy um, that that never happened because the people who ran this country for four years were terrible, terrible people. Um, but you know who are very good people and very good at their job are the TV producers who put together yeah. the Celebrating America TV show Wednesday night. Yeah. Uh, that Clearly, that show was produced by the same team that put together the Democratic Convention last summer. Yeah. And if they're on board to continue to do this kind of thing for Biden for the next four years, we're yeah. in very good hands in terms yeah. of I don't want to overemphasize the importance of that because it is just TV production. Mm-hmm. But it is how America sees this administration yeah. and, and how we celebrate civic holidays. And celebrating America, can you get more corny and patriotic than that? Oh, it was yes. it was cornballs. Yes, you can. Um, you, you, get Tom, you get Tom Hanks to do it. Yes, yeah, right. That's, that's, that's you get how you Tom do Hanks it. to host it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I did say at the end, goodbye, Tom Hanks. See you <laughs> next time. I, someone, I forget where, was saying, Tom mm-hmm. Hanks, you just got over the Rona. Wear a goddamn coat, okay? <laughs> Hold out there. You're a national treasure, Tom Hanks. Don't national take risks treasure. De- Dead Roger Ailes is spinning in his grave with envy, and yeah. the entire Republican Party really misses Roger Ailes. They yeah. really do well, in terms of TV production. Someone, yeah. I forget I forget who it was, someone at uh, at the uh, after the Kennedy inauguration, might have been mm-hmm. a year later, might have been fifty years later, I don't know, but pointed out that the spectacle of it and the sort of the glamour of it and the 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 processionality of it and the ritual of it that was so moving and very well done was they said, "Yep, that's a Catholic for you." You know, oh. you, you've had fifty, you've had you've had fifteen hundred years, you have seventeen hundred years of of having it drilled into your head that there's a ritualized 
series mm-hmm. of steps you go through and it has to be majestic and it has to be eternal mm-hmm. and it has to represent, mm-hmm. you know, great spectacular ideas and it should be mm-hmm. big and small and it should be. And, you know, there's something about the fact that Joe Biden is a, you know, is a dyed in the wool, uh, cradle to grave Catholic. And yeah. there's, a, there's a picture of the Pope on his desk. Um, yeah. So yeah. he really, you know, it was a wonderful thing. I, I personally like the fact that so much country music was infused in there. <laughs> I didn't feel bad making jokes about it. No, and and I for Tim McGraw, I think was one Tim of them. And we when he, after he sang, I said, I think that song was called "I'm an Independent Constitutional Conservative Who Never Liked the Tweeting." Yes. Let's hug. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I believe because it, it was like I just wrote this, this afternoon, so he, here we go. And it was, and I thought, oh, let's gonna, hug it out. Let's hug it. I, I was, I was, my money was on. Why did you give me the Rona Lurleen? <laughs> and, you know, that was his take on, you know, you, you took my dog and you took my horse and you took my, my truck and, and you cost me my job and you gave me the Rona. And because you mm. just stick that on there and it becomes a tragic country music song. Um, all of which is to say it, it gave us space to breathe and mm-hmm. and appreciate the sort of the, the not a return to something, mm-hmm. but there's an alternate version of the universe th- where this sort of thing would be considered just normal. And yeah. I don't want to go back to the what, what I'm being told over and over and over a thousand times a day on radio and television was, you know, four or five years ago. Because everything bad yeah, started right. four or five years ago. Now, I don't want to go back to the Bush administration. I don't want to go back to the birthers, you know, standing on Barack Obama's throat and calling him a Kennedy usurper and stealing Supreme. Mm-hmm. That's That was what happened before Trump. I don't want to go back mm-hmm. to that. I want a different country. I want the best of what's available. And we only get there. We only get to that place by remembering how we got here, mm-hmm. what went wrong, who we really are, who we could be, and the distance between who we were for the last four years and, frankly, the last 240 years mm-hmm. and where we want to be. The, the the Martin Luther King idea of I'm not here to ask for anything new. I'm here to ask for what you already promised me. Right. And I don't think that's right. unreasonable. I think there's 74 million people in this country, many of whom are armed to the teeth, who think that's no, no, we're not going to do that. But, yeah, we are. And But let's, and, let's talk about the two core responses to this week. Yeah. Okay. The first being um, people seeing a widely diverse, plain folks performance, mm-hmm. a kind of advertising where healthcare workers singing along, yeah, and they're all different uh, races and all different genders. And Braden, the boy who stuttered over the summer, delivering John F. Kennedy's inaugural address perfectly. You know what it just- reminded me of? <laughs> reminded me of of junior high school assemblies with mm-hmm. up with people up with people it, it, really, it was corny but effective and exactly. that that widely diverse plain folks advertising in the service of democrats comes across as genuine yeah. every time because that is who the party is mm-hmm. and i'm not patting myself on the back as a white woman for that at all no um we're going to get into Bree Newsom's tweet in a moment, and there's there we have we white Democrats have a lot to answer for. Well, we're and, we're just and, happy to be part of Stacey Abrams' party. Let's but we are happy it. to be part of yeah. Stacey Abrams' army and let her lead. Yeah, uh, and I don't mean let; I mean she leads. That's what I mean. Um, that contrasted with how dare Joe Biden mention white supremacy? What right. does he mean by that? He's silencing conservative thought. Right out of the bucket, that's their re- reaction and response. Yep. Yep. You dust protest way too much, folks. Carl, that's Carl Rove right out of the box. That, it's uh, Carl Rove. It's, it's, and, and uh, I was really pleased at a number of people remembering the past, Dave Nywert remembering the past and saying, this is Michelle Malkin 2009. Mm-hmm. This is when the FBI had a report saying, look, these white nationalists are arming themselves to the teeth and going underground. It's going to be a serious domestic terrorist threat. And Michelle Malkin jumps on television on Fox and says, Obama wants to silence conservatives. And this is Obama's FBI saying conservatives can't criticize him because they're terrorists. How dare you call me a terrorist? And I got to say, um, this is a little bit later on and we'll go into it in much greater depth, but I'm very hopeful mm-hmm. that that as we started hearing 
the the phrase both sides do it being made mock of all across mm-hmm. the internet, mm-hmm. led by, mm-hmm. frankly, people like us, because, you know, mm-hmm. we were out there really early and really frequently and almost to the point of making our listeners sick of it. Um, sorry about that, but <laughs> job well done, everyone. Well done. Um, but now we're hearing words like memory and amnesia. Right. More than right. I ever heard them before. And they're all predicated on this. We can't let them do it again. Right. We Never again. Do it again. And that is incredibly encouraging. It's a small mm-hmm. number of people now, but there is a, despite the fact there is this concerted effort to cut the past off at a certain point, there are people like Sheldon Whitehouse who's yeah. saying, you want to, you want to talk about Sheldon Whitehouse for a minute? Well, I don't want to skip over Bree Newsom. Oh no, no, we don't do that. <laughs> oh, we got to go by our notes, I think, or we'll forget something. <laughs> um, uh, here's the quote of the day from Bree Newsom. I don't share the desire that others have in unifying with those who've shown they want to kill us. At some point, I think we need to examine how much the fixation with unifying with white supremacists and convincing them to love us is rooted in oppression and the centering of whiteness. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's a deep, deep question that all of us, particularly white Democrats, need to ask. How are we centering whiteness? You know, I never recommend anyone else's podcast because it, <laughs> it, it takes away from the spotlight. All the time in the and world. you know that I, I have a, a, a tortured relationship with crooked media, which they're not aware of because they don't know I exist. So it's kind of a one-way <laughs> thing. But I, I, you know, I would recommend um, Anna Marie Cox's Friends uh, uh, Like These this week. She does a lot of other stuff that just doesn't interest me, frankly, or isn't my cup of tea. But this week she interviewed Adam Serwer. On mm-hmm, this very subject. Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. did the memory thing. He said, you know, uh, McKinley in 18, whatever it was, 18, 1890, gave the same speech, except, you know, he didn't mention white nationalism. And he talked about unity and how everything's behind us and how we need to come together as a nation. After and, the Civil War. After the Civil right. War. We need to right. come together and put all this, the racism's over. <clears throat> and there was the largest, bloodiest coup by white supremacists in history mm-hmm. immediately thereafter. And he did nothing about it at all. Yeah. He didn't even mention yeah. it at all. Mm-hmm. And white supremacists took the idea that this dumbass is is his call for unity means we can get away with whatever the hell we want. And that was well, and Jim- that is a perfect segue into Sheldon Whitehouse. Yes, I believe it. Sheldon is. Whitehouse on Medium this week, and I do recommend you go read it. It is part one of four. He he promises, and he's going to put these out once a week. And I love that he's decided to drizzle this out and not have a four part article in one article because he needs to be on television for the next four weeks talking about how we make things better. Episodic television. I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But his, his series part one of which came out this week is called mistakes. We should not repeat. (laughs) And he really should have called it No Fair Remembering Stuff. I know. But I think, you know, maybe he respected our copyright, unlike a lot of other uh, people. I don't know. Have we sent him a uh, No Fair Remembering Stuff bumper? No, we have not. Okay. <laughs> we should. We should. Uh, but, um, yeah, No Fair Remembering Stuff. He he said that the Democrats made a mistake saying let's move ahead. And and he very specifically says, and I'll I'll read this. The newly elected Obama administration decided that it was going to look forward, not back, and step out into a new and glad post-partisan future. Republicans laughed as they garroted that effort and gleefully and immediately dedicated themselves to neutering the Obama administration. But they also breathed a joyful sigh of relief as they realized there would be no accountability for the torture program and the bodyguard of lies surrounding it, for climate obstruction and the falsehoods upon which it stood, for the dishonorable conduct of industry hacks put into positions of public authority, or for the deceit that launched us into a bloody trillion-dollar war. This free pass was a message to the future that surely emboldened Trump administration flunkies as they took power and began to work their evil deeds in government. The Trump administration was orders of magnitude worse than the Bush administration in most areas. The only improvement over Bush, and no small one, is that Trump did not start a feudal war on false pretenses. The Trump years of corruption have been out of historic bounds and require investigation. 
no more not looking back. And he starts the next paragraph with, I'm a prosecutor. <laughs> and you can just see him thumbing his suspenders in a yes, hot right. summer's day on the porch. Mm-hmm. I'm just mm-hmm. a country prosecutor. I don't know a whole lot about stuff. But let me tell you. Yeah. And then he also in this article ha- early on has a message for Democrats. Democrats, including us progressive, possess some unhelpful traits. <laughs> we can be a herd of cats. We can fixate on process and rules while our opponents amass power. We can create purity testing circular firing squads, splintering over differences in ways that impede our own victory. We see our struggle as one over policy without giving due to the tough, seasoned, complex, dark money funded apparatus that opposes us. Mm-hmm. And I think we have to start getting really comfortable with power now. This is this is what having all three branches of government barely. Mm-hmm. And I I've said several times this week we need to Joe Manchin proof our majority in yes. 2022. Great for you know, this is the problem. Absolutely. Yep. This yep. is the problem. Um but we're we're gonna have to set aside people who want to people who are our allies who want to scream about small differences instead of no boom hammer hammer down republicans and make progress for i hate the word the american people but that's what i mean well that's what that's, <laughs> I, I just as a, as a writer that's just that cring, i that is very cringing to me let's let's just say that we believe in healthcare job security clean air and clean water for everybody for and everybody. decent wages yeah for i mean there a whole bunch of stuff right we all we believe in that stuff mm-hmm. and we do. um and it was a um, – well, we'll get to the press secretary later, but it, she she was a breath of fresh air. Um, she is a breath of fresh air. <laughs> I, I, I did, didn't want to um, uh, let the moment pass without mentioning that there's another event that took place this this week, which is of mm-hmm. some note thanks to mm-hmm. uh, our changing uh, – the change of administration, really. Um, Science Fiction University has returned. Yes. Um, in accordance with CDC guidelines – about not doing science fiction podcasts during a pandemic. No. The professional left did the right thing and put itself no. on hiatus no. back in March. That's not what, what we did? No. I, I'm pretty sure that's what we did. We I don't think you were at the meeting, but we agreed. But now Anthony Fauci that yesterday. To do with the CDC. Anthony Fauci yesterday just yesterday said, it's okay. You can do science fiction no. stuff now. It's great. <laughs> and rip your masks off and do a podcast. So we have returned to the fold. Um we have changed our introduction to each week to about once every so often. Whenever uh, we get to it, yeah, right? But I'm hoping but once a month. I'm really hoping this year we too. do once a month. Me too. I think that's that's a good that's a good target. Um, so we uh, we have a brand new episode of Science Fiction University up, which is available everywhere. It's it's on the Science Fiction University website, which is sciencefictionuniversity.com. Yeah, it's, so it's not hard to find, and and it's on. I posted it on my blog. Um, I posted it on my blog. I'm so, writing on my blog again. Oh, that's which is wonderful. Yeah, my wife Blue Gal. Is such a good writer, and you have been pouring so many, uh, so much blood, sweat, and tears into Crooks and Liars, which is much the better for it. But I really, I'm glad that you've gotten back to writing your own stuff on your own site. I'm writing my own stuff, and I'm writing about what books I'm reading and what knitting I'm doing, and mm-hmm. um, a lot of the political stuff is going as Driftglass just said. You know, that's Crooks and Liars is where I do that for money. So, yeah. um, but I am getting back to writing at my blog and I, it feels really good. So, yeah. yeah. And there were a couple of people that wrote me over the Christmas holiday and said, I really want to see the sweaters you made for the kids. You've talked yeah. about them. So they're posted at uh, Blue. If you Google Blue Gal, you'll find me. I'm right at the top of the Google search. So, mm-hmm. um, and Drift Glass got uh, banned from Twitter this week. He's, it's not Twitter jail. He's banned. And Banned's we're really fighting this. Yeah, um, speaking of not writing anymore on a on a medium that you've written on for a long time. Yeah, Twitter uh, wrote me and told me that I'm banned for life from Twitter. And if I attempt to start a new Twitter account, they will suspend that one too forever. So I'm, go- I'm off of Twitter forever. Well, um, we're fighting that. Yeah. We really are fighting that and, I, and I appealing and appealing. And, and uh, I've way, gotten mixed messages back. Shock is trying to help me. And other people have written me and said, well, it's possible it's not a permanent ban. And um, 
and we've had a lot of I've had a lot of support um, um, from lots of people on the internet who were like, mm-hmm. you did what to who now? Mm-hmm. Um, well, it, it must have been something pretty bad. You did, oh, you called a wingnut trash. Yeah. Who stepped and said her me. opinions were trash. Who I, talked to you first? She she stepped right? up and said like you and all the other lefties are are uh, batshit crazy in Wokistan. I said, "Well, uh-huh. you're trash and your opinions are worthless." And blah 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 blah, which you know, and that was it. Which I have seen worse stuff, you know, as as um Shocks did say, I've said worse things arguing with you over cilantro. Um <laughs> and yes. um and I got a notice immediately thereafter that I'm banned for life for mm-hmm. that tweet, which in no way uh, impugned her heritage or her race or her gender, didn't call, ask her to do physical harm, didn't target this person. I I, I went through the, the Twitter rules very carefully and it violated, didn't even come close to violating any of them at all. It wasn't even a close call. So there are some theories floating around, one of which is uh, we need to make an example of some liberal out there who ain't a blue check because that would be a, that would make us look stupid. Uh, and who isn't a celebrity. But somebody who's just you're sort of floating in the middle there, who's who's a nuisance, who pisses off never Trumpers, mm-hmm. <laughs> and pisses well, off and people who who are in the know about this say, you know, Twitter hates bad press. Yeah, and if they do that to a blue check, like Donald Trump, right. You know that makes national news. But they have um, to be able to tell their, you know, whoever they answer to, stockholders and, and users that no, 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 we, we police both sides. We police yeah, both right. sides. We. And I just posted up, you know, just a uh, – I pulled from like the same week, um, Rick Wilson just calling someone an inbred – No, he said, he said someone's mother drank battery acid while nursing you. Yeah, well, yeah no, something she, to that effect. She was huffing it in the men's room where she was, you know, <laughs> whoring herself out and just uh, – da 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 At a gas station yeah. somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it was just really personal <laughs> – and about your mom. And, and that's, that's trash talk, but and still. And that's his everyday vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. It's, it, it's like, and you're, well, no, see, and here's the problem. There aren't an army of bots and trolls who are mm-hmm. hunting down uh, Rick Wilson. And no, making, making his life unpleasant and, and calling his attention to, you know, the Twitter jailers every time. So, um, like I said, I, I expect it to, you know, be forever, but maybe some of the lobbying efforts will will flip it over. And again, there's a theory that it's David Frum and Stuart Stevens who who, are, who really don't like being called, you know, out like I do every day or mm-hmm, used to mm-hmm, on, mm-hmm. You know, on a public forum. Like uh, this very day, Stuart Stevens had written this glowing thing about Michael Gerson is one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. And I knew I met him in 1999. And he's just he's a fucking saint. He's such a wonderful guy. I said, maybe you've forgotten. I just went down like 15 examples of Here's where David Gerson said this, and here's where he said this. I, Michael like, Gerson, yeah. Mike, I'm sorry, Michael Gerson. One of the benefits of having a 16-year deep archive mm-hmm. and writing every day is that I have mm-hmm. this stuff at my fingertips. So I just pulled it out and said, here's like a 12,000-word post that would have been in the Atlantic in an alternate universe, and that you would have seen it there, um, detailing all the shit Michael Gerson used to believe like right up until Donald Trump was elected. <laughs> and it was just – heinous stuff about Barack Obama and Democrats and socialists and how uh, just awful, awful shit. And all of which has gone down the memory hole because yeah. it's very inconvenient for Stuart Stevens, who actually did write a book called It's a Lie, to to make, to make personalize it to his close personal friend, Michael Gerson, who he needs to believe is a saint, even though that is a lie. So I went, here's, here's what you're wrong and you're wrong and you're wrong. And here's the proof and here's the proof and here's the receipt. And about two hours later, I was banned for life from Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. So it could be well, and, and this is particularly hard on me that you've been banned from Twitter. Well, yeah. Just you know why? Because I, I don't have an outlet anymore. So I just go around <laughs> the house shouting, you're wrong, at sign Stuart Stevens. Michael Gerson has been a billionth troll for decades. Uh, yeah. So I just shout my tweets now at my poor wife, generally <laughs> at, at the universe. <laughs> it, actually, it has. it is hard on me just from the standpoint of – prepping for this podcast so often i will just forward stuff to you and say podcastable here 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 and uh i'm he i've been proud of drift class because he's really not interested in going behind twitter no and creating a fake account or doing so you know no i i want my account back or goodbye farewell and i'll take my hits and and move on but uh it's very unfair and it's definitely an uneven uh selective enforcement yeah, that's the word. 
They are enforcing the rules very wildly selectively. Yes. yes. And and honestly, this is a little bit of a deeper complaint, which I'm, I, I'm not going to let it get at great length now. But everyone who listens to this podcast knows I got thrown into Twitter jail for calling Bill Maher a whore with a W. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go out and look at the number of people who use that word now. It's gone from Twitter, by the way. It's gone. No one mm-hmm. uses it anymore because they made an example of me. And now no one calls anyone a whore on Twitter. Ever. Yeah, ever they again. do all the time. No, they didn't. Okay. Um, I, I got tossed <laughs> for the G word for GIMP and go out. I just went on the day of because I, I use a quote from Pulp Fiction to refer to Lindsey Graham. And and there were like 1,500 people using the same quote to refer to Lindsey Graham like that day. So yeah, it yeah. isn't me. <laughs> it is definitely not me. And it's not. Well, you're just day. you're just big enough on Twitter to be a target. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So. Anyway, moving on. That's that's why you haven't seen me on Twitter. And please, one more thing. Don't DM me on Twitter. I, ha- <laughs> I can still see my profile and there's all these DMs stacking up. As a, you know what ban for life means, right? I can't right. see anything you send me. I can't respond right. to it. I'm, right. I'm out. So please stop doing that. Um, uh, but, but mail checks to P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois. Springfield, Illinois, 62791. Don't send them to the lady who hired a private jet. To fly to the no. MAGA riot? No. Because she's now fundraising on um, wherever, whatever platform she's using to try to get help for – she needs a lawyer. Yeah. You know, I need I need money for my legal defense because Donald Trump didn't pardon me. Yeah. So she's, she's fundraising, um, although she rented a – Lear jet to take her to the riot. Okay. As, as one does. That's how one as goes. As one does, right. yes. Yeah. Uh, there is no honeymoon for Joe Biden on Fox News. Fox yeah. News has just dropped right back into Obama territory. Uh, Sean Hannity, the first day on the job, called uh, the newly inaugurated president, the weak, the frail, cognitively struggling Biden. Uh, and Hannity, I did a whole article about Hannity's uh, monologue where he's just, as you called it, a carbon-based pe- Pez dispensers spitting out disjointed sentence fragments made up of Fox News talking points. The The phrase of the day, uh, the day before the inauguration, was re-education camps. They're going to force Republicans into re-education camps mm-hmm. to, to erase our memories of Donald Trump. It's going to happen. They're going to lie. They're going to put us in a camp. And here was Hannity. And, you know, I don't expect that people won't ad lib on cable TV or they won't talk about, you know, but this, this guy had nothing. He didn't have a script. He didn't have a preparation. It was just one catchphrase after that. I'm going to tell you folks, I've been at this business for 30 years on radio and television and, uh, camps, that's it. Camps. Mm -hmm. They're going to put us in camps because of our differing political opinions. Yeah. Political opinions, you know, we, this is America. And, and it, it was as if he'd been told to stretch it out because the next commercial wasn't ready yet, you know? Right. And we've heard from uh, Brian Stelter's book that Hannity is just incredibly lazy. Yeah. And will occasionally uh, record his news show the previous day so he can have a three day weekend. Because mm-hmm. uh, it's not news; it's just Biden laptop, you know, Hunter Biden. And last night, Thursday night, he interviewed the Lucky Charms leprechaun, computer repair man, about Hunter Biden's laptop. And this guy was wearing a tam o' shanter. <laughs> oh, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so much there's so much gold on this laptop you wouldn't believe it. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. You got to look at the picture and the uh, or if you can see the the clip somewhere. Hannity interviewing the Hunter Biden laptop guy. Uh it's just it and it's not just Hannity. Everyone is returning to square one. Well, yeah. In and, the and, media. And that is literally true because I I I I remember and I'm sure you do too right after Obama's inauguration. Mm-hmm. Right after mm-hmm. Um, there was a whole special on the Daily Show with Jon Stewart uh, about Potato Day. Potato about, Day, about, yes. About dead Andrew Breitbart talking about how it used to be St. Patrick's Day, but thanks to liberals and the liberal elite and their jackbooted blah, 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 now it's called Potato Day at my son's school. And mm. just this, and this whole string of all the same people that you see on television now, except the ones that are now dead, like Andrew Breitbart, all the same people, you know, 
security has come to our shores. And what was <laughs> Michelle Bachman saying? Or I, it was Michelle Bachman or Sarah Palin because they're the same person, let's face it. Uh-huh. You know, she was uh, frightened of the FEMA re-education camps. They, they were yep. definitely going to be set up and we were going to be sent there. And and John Stewart said, yeah, but you have to educate them first. Um, <laughs> and before you re-educate them. Yep. yep. But it is just a stupid thing that these, since I could do it on the podcast, these trash people all have programmed into their brains. They have a little pleasure center. And every time they, they get touched, one of them gets touched. Ooh, re-education. Ooh, gun grabbers. Ooh, gay agenda. Ooh, uh, the small government. Ooh, Kenya. They, they have a little shot of pleasure that goes through their brain. And that's mm-hmm. all you have to do mm-hmm. to go on Fox. You have to, if you're a woman, you have to have short skirt and tits and be blonde preferably and mm-hmm. just spew this bullshit out and, and interview leprechauns for some reason. And, and you look at this and you realize if Fox News started today just you know this were a normal healthy country and and the 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 basic primetime lineup of fox news were rolled out today the police and and mental health professionals would show up and drag them away Mm -hmm. it took 30 years of tuning up the base to be this stupid and this brainwashed and this hateful and this racist and this willing to believe anything they say to get to a point where sean hannity can basically jerk off at his desk and make you like it and interview a leprechaun and think it's news and you and you not change the channel and go, holy shit, what, what is this? And that's 74 <laughs> million people in this country are that fucked in the head. That's the next. Well, thing. and they've been fucked in the head by a, a very conscious brainwashing effort by Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. And and I've talked about this before, but Benghazi, Whitewater, emails, Solyndra, Baby Parts, Fast and Furious, the Tarmac, Vince Foster, birth certificate, food stamp fraud, on and on and on. Mm hmm. Christmas card lists, tan suit, whatever. All of that is trigger words to, as you say, emote an immediate, hateful, rabid mental response. Uh-huh. And if you've been subject to that nightly mm-hmm. by turning on a thing that you call the news to have it dr- drilled into your brain that you'll have this reaction every time you hear tarmac, Hillary Clinton, crime. Bill Clinton, crime, crime. You know, of course, this is what's going to happen to you. And, and and the problem is it's happening to our country. It would be one thing if we had them in a paddock, you know, <laughs> in a re-education camp. <laughs> we'll just an island somewhere. You know, just, we'll feed them. We'll yeah. make sure they have to go. Just like in Lost, on an island somewhere. But because of gerrymandering mm-hmm. and because of the racist policies of minority rule in the Senate, we have a real problem. In our well, politics and in our government. And, and because of, let's face it, capitalism. Because yeah. um, uh, if I happen to miss Sean Hannity's show one day, which, you know, geez, I would never <laughs> let that happen. I don't need to worry because on the local radio station that has one liberal on it for two hours a day, I believe, or three maybe, uh, that's it. That's the only liberal radio you're going to find anywhere in, in where we live. I believe right after him or 30 minutes after him is the Sean Hannity show. So I guess the the radio station does that for balance, but I think they do it because they know they live in a county, they broadcast in a broadcast area that went overwhelmingly for um, Darren LaHood and Rodney Davis and Donald Trump. This is Trump country. And so Mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. these shitheads want to listen to is toxic bullshit being crapped into their skulls. And that's what local commercial radio will give them because that is what they want. And that's what they, they want to sell cars and they want to sell, uh, uh, Real estate, and they want to sell housing services and lawn care. They want to sell all the things that that keep the radio station running. They want mm-hmm, people mm-hmm. to buy that shit. And the only reason they come to that place is because they get to hear Sean Hannity two or three hours a night, in addition to their daily fix. Right. And that's right. just, and that's everywhere. That's everywhere in this country, except for you know little liberal enclaves like let's say Chicago. Um, yeah. You won't, but everywhere else in this country, this poison is just bubbling right below the surface, and it's not going away. That's why I, I did a post today. Uh, yesterday it was very short. My mood is shawarma because I'm feeling like the end of the first Avengers movie, uh huh. Where you know Tony Stark wakes up and goes, "What happened?" and and Captain America looks around and says at this rubble and says, "Well, we won." <laughs> and Thor says, "But it's not over." I'm mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay. Well, first of all, yay. <laughs> Let's have some shawarma, let's right? Take, and let's all take the day off tomorrow, okay? Let's all let's all rest and let's go have some shawarma together. So, and all that is true, and that really is my mood. I think there's real cause for celebration and hope, 
um, that the the new administration looks great. Um, they they have uh, cabinet appointments that are going very well so far. And whatever policy agreements you might have, legitimate policy disagreements you might have with them, there's not a Betsy DeVos or Wilbur Ross or Ben Carson in that bunch anywhere. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. they're just Mm -hmm. an order or two or three of magnitude better than anything the Trump administration did. And we have a new press secretary named uh, Jen Psaki, Uh who is is not a pathological liar. I know this is shocking. She's not. And so far, and granted it's been a day and a half or two days, she has been very good at deconstructing clickbait batshit questions that would cause mm-hmm. me to come across the podium and start punching people like asked you know why aren't you giving a, a a fig leaf and a cookie and a pat on the head to republicans why aren't you appointing republicans to the cabinet huh why why what's well, just unity talk and rather than say shut your hole you ass she says what republicans don't believe in unemployment insurance yeah republicans don't, don't they do they not want covid to go away do they, do they don't believe in vaccines do they do they not want businesses open do they not want schools open because those are all real bipartisan things that we're all in favor of we which, really want to reopen schools yeah which shut him down yes, and it and it was honest it was a correct mm-hmm. answer mm-hmm. and fauci comes out there and says you know what yeah i'm liberated now i'll i i, I now work at a place where the science guides what we say we're going to be very transparent. If we make a mistake, we're going to correct it. We're not going to lie about it. And if I say something that that is bad or unfortunate, no one's going to punish me for it if the science is right. No, I don't have to worry well, about and, it. And also, if he doesn't know the answer, he's allowed to say, I don't know. Yeah, which is And just, you could tell he was just delighted that he was able oh. to say, we don't have the answer to that one yet. Mm-hmm. Let's go find out. Let's put some funding in it so we can go find out. As the website The Beaverton said this week. <laughs> Canada is happy for the friend who just got out of the terrible relationship. Oh, like, well, and and the analogies to an abused spouse, I can personally attest to that. Yeah. And I can I know a lot of other women who can personally attest to the PTSD of having to wake up every day wondering if the president of the United States slash your aunt your husband has woken up in a good mood or not. Mm-hmm. And that's gonna affect your whole day. Mm-hmm. Uh you know, and and being glad that he just went off to the golf course for the day. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank God he's gone. Yep. You know that yep. you've kept him occupied with something else. Um. So yeah, I mean that we're out of that terrible relationship, and let's again. You, it's like it's like when you get divorced. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't know. Never about again. That. Never right? again. Never again. <laughs> Um, I did want to say something. I wrote a long, long thing that I'm not going to read, but I did want to mention something that about St. Peter's Basilica and indulgences and the invention of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, it's a long thing, and it's something I've written about before and talked about on this podcast incessantly, but I, I want to mention it again because we talk a lot about amnesia and memory and memory and, and, and memories are secret, is our superpower, and we have to remember the past and how we now have a large number of people who agree that we can't let this happen again. And again is the key word because again means this happened before. Mm-hmm. And if mm-hmm. you listen, as I've already said, if you listen carefully to pretty much every MSNBC broadcast, if you listen to CNN, if you listen to um, Never Trump podcast, if you if you read them in the paper, Tom Nichols had a thing yesterday in the Atlantic and it, it, everything began in 2016. Mm-hmm. Nothing preceded it. And according to Tom Nichols, everything is the fault of Americans. <laughs> there's an amorphous no, there's no political parties there's just americans did a really stupid thing and under trump america became this whiny you know, entitled asshole country and it had nothing to do with anything that certainly tom nichols was involved certainly with. certainly didn't have anything to do with the republican party right and or republican base voters no no no, no chose no. donald trump right just yeah just people and and the people who invaded the capital the insurrectionists were um, Trump cultists. They weren't Republicans. They were Trump cultists. And they were just as bad as pretty much the BLM people for oh, pretty yeah. much the same reason. And it was just, he he is such a fucking dishonest scumbag. He is so smug and self-righteous. And, and, and the problem is he writes for the Atlantic now. He's our friend now. He's, and his goal and the goal of most of these guys, not all of them, most of them is you are not going to hold me responsible or anyone else I know for any of the things that happened before 2016, period. Even though I did it, even though I did it. So why? Why can't we? I mean, if if they are all now bragging about how brilliant they were for, for seeing Trump coming in 2016, how come those of us who saw this coming in 2009 
in 2006, mm-hmm. in 1994, mm-hmm. aren't even more virtuous, even more brilliant? Well, because that would lead to a bunch of unfortunate questions about right. what our new prophets were doing. So they have divided time up into three pieces. There's a before time and a middle time and an after time. And the reason is very simple. And this is where St. Peter's Basilica comes in. That beautiful building in the Vatican, the, the first or second largest church in the world, was paid for by a thing called indulgences, which when the Catholic Church invented hell, when St. Augustine invented hell out of whole cloth and decided that people who sin uh, in a particular way are going to burn in a lake of fire forever, it was game over. Because f- for the next 1,500 years, Catholics, the, all of Catholicism is about who's going to hell and who's going to hell sleepaway camp called purgatory and who's going to heaven. And the only person who got to decide whether you were going to hell or not was your local priest, was mm-hmm. the church. They mm-hmm. decided whether or not you will burn in a like fire forever or you'll go to paradise. And they decided, this is pretty cool. We own a monopoly on this. So we can start just charging people for it. We can charge money for it. And St. Peter's Basilica, which took, I believe, 500 years to build or something like that, a staggering amount of time to finish, was paid for by charging rich people a fee to keep them out of hell. Mm-hmm. You it's called an indulgence. It's yeah. called an indulgence. And there were partial indulgences for the for the uh, budget-minded sinner. And there were, there were complete indulgences, total indulgences for all of your sins are forgiven for a, a certain amount of money. And this went on for centuries. In fact, it went on pretty much until Mar- a guy named Martin Luther showed up and said, what the fuck is going on here? And disrupted everything. And eventually there was a counter-reformation and blah, blah, blah. But this is a thing. You invent a, a process by which you are either saved or you're damned. Mm-hmm. And then you, and you invent that process. And then you put yourself in the middle of it as the sole arbiter of who gets saved and who gets damned. And, that but, is what, and that's, that's, that's very helpful because that's why Rick Wilson is talking about you'll never work in this town again. Exactly. Because, because that's the hell. That's the hell. That, and it's Rick that Wilson saying nobody this. in Washington wants to be in. Right. right? Well, Steve Schmidt. It has, has to be this. a revolving door. Steve right. Schmidt said, you know, book publishers uh, went down the list of things, all the things that never Trumpers do. They get books, they get magazine gigs, they get speaking engagements. He said, basically, if you have those things and you aren't saved, then you're, mm-hmm. then, then you don't get any of that. And Stuart Stevens says, and we're keeping an enemies list. We're keeping mm-hmm. a database at the Lincoln Project of all the people who didn't get right with Jesus soon enough. Now, here's the tricky part. George Conway didn't get right with the Lord until like 2017, maybe mm-hmm. 2018. Late, so, late 2017. So, so we have yeah. to have the, the, the start time for salvation being then. The latest possible <laughs> moment you can be saved is 2018. But the earliest possible moment that you go to hell is 2019 or so. Mm-hmm. So after that, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're beyond salvation. And they have been very clear, unless you confess and atone, you're fucked. Now, that is, by the way, exactly what I asked of the Lincoln Project people five years ago and four years ago and (laughs) three years ago and two years ago and was told by my allies, what the hell are you doing? They're our friends. They're the good guys. Well, you know what? Those good guys now control the media. You can't swing a fucking dead cat on MSNBC without hitting a never Trumper. Where are all my friends at Slate? Where are all the liberal bloggers? Are you on are you on MSNBC? Do you write for (laughs) The Atlantic? No, you do not, because they own the message now. And what's the message? Everything before 2016, which means all of your liberal blogs and your archives and your podcasts, don't count. Mm-hmm. Being right before 2016 is just is just, we're not even going to talk about it. You don't exist. Liberals do not exist. The only people who exist are people who are Republican and who got right with God between 2016 and 2018. And that's the before time. And there's the middle time where the saved are. And people who came to Jesus during that time are geniuses. They're martyrs too, because they gave up a lot of money to get right with God. I, now, I've seen them get book contracts and TV deals, so I'm not, not sure how much money they actually gave up. But apparently they lost an incredible amount of money by doing the right thing. Well, good for them. Well, no, they're they're going to Israel now well, yeah, and doing uh, ad buys for foreign countries. So. Sure. You're going to mention that. That's just going to ruin. <laughs> you're going to get yourself kicked off Twitter for doing that. It ruins the narrative if, if they make money overseas in political campaigns. And, and yeah. the after time. You only get let back into the club of the saved if you bend your knee and ask forgiveness from Wick, Rick Wilson. Yeah. That's it. Now, Drift Glass, I'm going to ask you something. And I'm, I'm done with that discussion, but. Good, good, because we have time. you and I kind of had a, had a disagreement about this this morning about yes, whether, you know, we needed to continue to 
dwell on the Lincoln Project. And here, here's my deal. Mm-hmm. If the Lincoln Project goes on and owns MSNBC, so to speak, the, the minutes, all the free airtime that they get. Several million a day. In, Seven in million value. a day in free advertising. Yep. From Several million. And, Several million and, a day and, you know, that, that's their career. Right. Meanwhile, uh, Joe Biden, who, by the way, reminds me a lot in the way he's operating of our governor, Pritzker. Yeah, he does. He does. In terms of going along, going along, getting behind a podium, saying folks, talking about mm-hmm. stuff. And then he goes back to work and all this liberal shit happens. Yep. <laughs> How many all these progressive are- agenda things happen. The the guy at the lawyer at the National Labor Relations Board got fired. Gone. And that's what was supposed to happen. Yeah. Keystone uh, Pipeline, dead. Keystone Pipeline, dead. He put a woman who was an active, active net neutrality activist mm-hmm. in charge of the FCC. She is an acting director of the FCC now. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, I forget her name, but um, she the only reason she's acting is she's not sure she wants the job, I believe, for the full term. Uh-huh. Um, but she definitely wants to come in and clean up the shit that the Trump administration did on net neutrality. That is mm-hmm. a passion of hers. And there she is in a position of power to do it. And so, uh, you know, getting all this liberal shit done while Rick Wilson is on MSNBC, I'll take it. Uh, that's that's um, you make a very good point. You make a very valid point. I, I my my only problem. And this is where I'm going to win this this debate because I already know the outcome, <laughs> which is if you let the people who committed atrocities get away with rewriting the past, it mm-hmm. will repeat itself. Yeah. It just right. always will. Right. So right. the right. entire liberal critique of the right of conservatives is now non-existent. It's okay. A- Except here's the deal. Uh-huh. I I think, and I, I maybe I'm just a Pollyanna, and, mm-hmm. and if I am, I am. Okay. Okay. Uh, Everyone seems to be, as I said earlier in this podcast, seems to be returning to square one. That's true. Chuck Todd is saying, yeah. oh, if he doesn't get 100 million doses yeah. out, and he said this like the day before he's inaugurated, he'll days. be a failed president. Failed president. Failed president. That'll be it. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, everyone on Twitter jumped down his throat. Well, fire him. Me. You know, fire him. Me. You weren't there. You weren't yeah, there to do there's it. There's okay. the problem. Yeah. There's the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but everyone is returning to square one except the audience. Uh-huh. And I really feel like the the number of women who – the number of women who felt that Donald Trump was an abusive spouse uh-huh. and had PTSD over almost losing their health care mm-hmm. in March, April of 2017 – and the and the Rose Garden Party re- that Republicans had over taking away health care uh-huh. from from millions of people, twenty one million people. Yeah, you know we have a lot of PTSD over this administration, yeah. and we're different now. We're radicalized now. There was a woman on Twitter who said that she she sort of had a jolt about herself this week mm-hmm. because four years ago she she looked at the Republican Party and the Republican Senate as a bunch of white guys. And she said, I was sitting there watching Senate proceedings and yelling at individual senators by first name and last name. You fucker, you fucker. Yeah. And, and she she turned to her husband and she said, four years ago, I didn't know any of these guys. Yeah. I, I didn't know. We've been fucker, radicalized. Yeah. Yeah. We've been radicalized. And mm-hmm. that there's no going back from that. I agree. So I think there's a shock coming to the system a further shock coming to the system, and, and it's going to be tested in the midterms in 2022. I'm so glad to see people already talking about the midterms, already saying we've got to solidify our majority in the Senate. There's a hunger to just get Mitch McConnell out of there. Yep. Well, you, that that's not going to happen because no. He well, elected. but he, but he if if there's five more Democratic senators in yeah, in the Senate, yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, no, he I, doesn't I, get. He doesn't get to hold up anything and say sh- power sharing bullshit. Uh, yep. And and the, and the whole power sharing bullshit thing. I mean, the Democratic base needs to be a, a base to re- be reckoned with in in like manner to how the Republican base is terrifying Republican senators right now. I I don't. I think more. I think we have a better relationship with our senators, uh-huh. and they aren't quite as terrified of us in a violent way. Yep. But they need to be. They need to be aware that we're watching, mm-hmm. and that we are not ready to make nice. And we don't want bipartisanship. We want them to take power and wield it and make the 
world a better place. Uh, Our uh, agenda matters. Uh, I will not agree with, not disagree with any of that. It's all completely correct. And I'm going to, I'll, I'll leave it at this. And I don't mm-hmm. mean to say, say uh, get the last word because. No, but I think this makes a good podcast yeah. because of our different perspectives. Well, and because I get the last word because of the patriarchy. So well, I was going to say the dick measuring that you must do with Rick Wilson is so important. Rick. Well, and, you know, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't gamble on that. It, when I know I'm going to win. It's not called right. gambling if you know you'll crush the little guy. So, you know, that's exactly. just, that's not even fair. <laughs> he's what? six foot eight, has a size 13 shoe, and he's yeah. not worried, folks. I'm not worried at all. <laughs> I'm fine. Every, everything about my life is so much better than I deserve. I should I count my blessings <laughs> every day. I, absolutely, I And I've been through, you know, I've been unemployed and lost several careers. Everything about my life is better than I deserve. And I believe that and I understand that. And I, I do count my blessings every day. I will say, however, control of the message, the mainstream media message still matters. Mm -hmm. It still matters because it is a slow, erosive process. Mm -hmm. If you tell someone both sides are bad once, they're going to laugh you out of church. Mm -hmm. If you tell them through um, uh, David Broder and Peggy Noonan Mm -hmm. (laughs) and, Mm -hmm. and Tim Russert, for mm-hmm. year after year after year, longer mm-hmm. than Fox News has been around. Right. It, and, right. and you train a, a large number of not terribly politically committed or maybe slightly politically committed people sort of in the middle that to automatically factor out any Republican atrocity because Democrats are just as bad. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. end up here. This, right. The, the reason right. we're here is a whole bunch of people have been brainwashed who aren't Fox News listeners but have, have come to believe – as, as the joke I was telling in 2006, if Dick Cheney were caught on the White House lawn throwing burning kittens at homeless veterans, the first three words out of David Gregory's mouth would be, but the Democrats. Mm-hmm. That's how mm-hmm. long this shit has been poisoning our, our, our dialogue. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the reason that more people do not rise up in righteous indignation and demand that the Congress stop fucking around and, and that the Democrats stop pulling their punches is because they believe – in their heart, that somehow both sides are wrong. Yeah. So both yeah. sides are bad. And that is what happened this week. I've I've seen three major publications. Tom Nichols is one of them. I'm not going to talk about David Brooks, but David Brooks is one of them. Have gone right back to both sides are bad. Yep. Both sides are wrong. Both sides left and right, left and right, left and right. Yep. And now maybe that is just an echo of a dying age. Maybe it has no influence at, at all. I on think it's their anymore. safe space for a what place is? where they don't know how to where to stand. And I will add to that list. Mm-hmm. A protester, I believe it was in Washington State at the Capitol, who had they had a live stream of like six guys standing outside with seventeen or eighteen uh, National Guard yeah, that troops. Was, that was kind of hilarious. Fr- and and it was a live stream. But the moment I clicked on it to listen to the live stream, the guy had an air horn, and he was saying, <laughs> "I'm an independent, believe it or not." Yeah, of course you. Are. Both sides are to blame in all of this. Of course you are. This is where they go to regroup. Between, yeah, exactly. Between and this is where this is where the mainstream media voices go to regroup as well. And, and if we are saying that there must be consequences for Republicans for being mm-hmm. horrible people, mm-hmm. we have to also say there have to be consequences for media personalities with huge audiences and enormous salaries when they are constantly wrong about everything all the time. There ha- and there won't be. That's what scares there me. Be. There, if, if there won't be because you, of personal relationships. If Sheldon yeah. Whitehouse is right, and he is that the pro, we're not going to make the same mistake we made last time and let Republicans off the hook. There's no control mechanism over the media. There's nobody telling Phil Griffin to fire Chuck Todd and replace him with anyone else. <laughs> There's no one telling the Schulzberger family that David Brooks has got to be put out to pasture. Mm-hmm. Stand up, say mm-hmm. to play with other centrists for the rest of his life. Mm-hmm. And, and some <laughs> other person who actually will talk truth through that incredibly important piece of real estate at the New York Times op-ed page to the American people is actually someone you should get. Get Digby. If she doesn't want to go on television, great. Have her write a column for the New York Times twice a week. That'd be terrific. But there's no mechanism other than commerce. And commerce dictates that media corporations will provide the product that their customers want. And the customers now want on the right to believe liberals are monsters and the middle that both sides are to blame. So 
Let's do a news roundup. Let let me just read the quote of the week from uh, Russian sock puppet and Republican Senator Ron Johnson. Yeah, well, yeah. Democrats can't have it both ways, an unconstitutional impeachment trial and Senate confirmation Mm -hmm. of the Biden administration's national security team. Mm -hmm. He went that specific? Yep. Wow. Yes, he did. They need to choose between being vindictive or staffing the net the national security team mm-hmm. i'm i'm stuck on that i'm sorry i'm really stuck on that well ron johnson is a russian sock puppet russian he? sock puppet it's so specific that he's a russian mm-hmm. sock puppet about mm-hmm. this they need to choose between being vindictive or staffing the administration to keep the nation safe mm-hmm. which will it be revenge or security and you know he can go fuck himself he's I a like russian little, sock puppet i like puppet. one from column a and two from column b that's all mm-hmm. we um, can do all of it yes now, um, in the you want to talk about local news and, and uh, we skip through this? I'm yeah. going to skip a little bit through the national news because this, this week saw the worst abuse of pardon power in American history. Mm-hmm. Uh, we learned that the vaccine reserve was already exhausted, which we knew last week. This week we learned the Biden administration discovered there was never a vaccine plan at all. They right. had to start over from scratch. There was never a plan. Another, another Jared Kushner win for America. <laughs> and, uh, and Trump's 1776 commission report. Yeah. Which people have compared to a C minus sixth grade yeah. book report. Uh supposed to be the definitive patriotic view of US history that would save America from left wing indoctrination by our schools by requiring a new pro America curriculum. Uh has been roundly mocked by historians and a little over a quarter of the content was copied from other sources without citations, just like Melania's speech at the twenty sixteen <laughs> Republican convention. And this Yay! And this little piece goes together. Today, uh, Chuck Schumer said that he spoke to Speaker Pelosi and the articles of impeachment will be delivered on Monday. That's two days from now. Make no mistake, he said there will be a full trial. It will be a fair trial. Okay, good. Mitch McConnell said the mob that stormed the Capitol was, quote, fed lies and, quote, provoked by the president into violence, which is great. Then Mitch McConnell turned around and said that he is going to filibuster the organizing resolution which is the thing that allows Democrats to assume committee chair uh, chair positions, which is completely unprecedented. So Mitch McConnell remains a soulless monster who is only interested in preserving power. Donald Trump doesn't interest him anymore. He is mm-hmm. Donald Trump is now useful in a it, it, to have a stall as a stalling tactic. Sure, we'll do mm-hmm. impeachment, and we're going to drag this shit out for weeks, and mm-hmm. we're not going to let you get anything done at all. We're not going to let you do two things at once during the day, and then after two or three weeks. We'll convict him or we won't, but then we'll turn around and say, look how much time you wasted while America. Mm-hmm. Oh, look, the hundred days is over. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Local news. Let's let's do no- local news. Um, Congressman Darren LaHood has joined a growing list of Republicans who find it divisive for Democrats to come out aggressively against white supremacists. A headline hungry local wingnut lawmaker named Dan Calkins. He's a Republican from Decatur was infuriated that National Guard troops are being vetted in advance of the inauguration. He called it a slap in the face. And demanded Governor Pritzker give them the option to return home. Uh, he's a retired member of the Illinois National Guard, and I must say, does not speak well of the guard that a fragile snowflake like Dan Calkins was able to rise to the rank of infantry major. Mm. Um, I attended today a virtual political roundtable of political reporters, and they talked about a lot of stuff. It's a local citizens group, and it's very informative. And there's there's some things that I gleaned from the political reporters who do the, the shoe leather reporting in this town. First is <clears throat> Adam Kinzinger looks like he's lining up to run for governor, but uh, getting through the GOP primary will be brutal. And uh, then he'll lose to Pritzker. Yeah. Well, then he'll lose to Pritzker, but he's got a good resume and he came out early and he's like he came very early against Trump. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see uh, at the local level. Police reform is all bullshit. It's all talk, but at the state level, It looks like some actual good things are happening. The Black Caucus in Illinois passed three of the four pillars of Mm -hmm. their um, of their changes during the lame duck session. That's a session, a special session we have in Illinois when they all come back and do a a brief number of things. They did education reform, economic reform and police reform. Watch for health care reform in the spring. Uh, They're proving that black lives do, in fact, matter. And Um, we did hear from a couple of listeners that the new speaker of the House in Springfield, who is the first black speaker, mm-hmm. um, is a machine politician. And uh, you know, don't don't praise him too much because he's yeah. part of the Madigan machine, blah, blah, blah. It's yeah. like, I don't think anyone who's not a part of the Madigan machine could be no. elected speaker. So no. that, that corruption still exists and we're aware of it. Um, 
I'm still going to celebrate uh, the fact that we have the black people have a representation in the leadership of the House of Representatives in Illinois. That is a good thing. And uh, the Black Caucus is getting stuff done. They really are for the people of Illinois. And I will remind everyone that Harold Washington, mayor of the city of Chicago for one and a half terms until he passed Mm -hmm. away, was a typical machine politician Mm -hmm. under the daily Mm -hmm. regime right up until he wasn't. And he was free Mm -hmm. to do what he wanted. And then he did some amazing stuff. So, you know, I'm not going to say it's impossible or possible. I'm just going to sort of have an open mind until uh, until things move. The uh, the new economic development project here in Springfield, which is a public private partnership, is not doing much of anything. And the guy that hired to run it is currently being paid more than the county officials, which is, you know, pretty typical for here. Uh, IDES, which is the um, employment office, the actual physical employment office in Springfield and across the state, has been a train wreck. Uh, I'm told they've been hiring. Um, And I feel like I dodged a bullet a little bit uh, because I actually applied for a job to run the place two years ago and was passed over for that job. Um, The problem is they've spent years, the Republicans have spent years hollowing out the government and it's gotten somewhat better, but not a lot. So there's that. Um, Everybody gives high marks to uh, Governor Pritzker and to local school officials for handling the pandemic. Um, We were reminded that public service, when it's done correctly, is just hard work and usually Mm -hmm. involves telling a lot of people things they don't want to hear, which nobody wants to do for a living. Now, this one hit home especially because it involves um, economic development in the in the one way the government can do economic development directly, which is move jobs around. The EPA building was relocated from the poor side of town to the richest side of town, taking all the jobs with them, and nobody knew. Everybody who was involved in the, the planning of it knew, of course, but nobody called reporters. Nobody called the paper. There were no protests. It was kept very quiet until it was done, you know, all in one night practically. This pulls hundreds of jobs out of an area that needed them and put them in a mall far away. This is the largest shift of jobs in the Springfield municipal area in history. Now, this is unbelievable. Here's why this is important. Not because those people live in that neighborhood. Uh, When I worked for the city of Chicago, I worked in a building that was on the corner of roughly Ashland in Chicago. The city, I, I knew that neighborhood from years gone by. It was Wicker Park in that area around there, which was a blighted, blown out, run down, neglected neighborhood. The city rehabbed the Goldblatt's building, which sat sat on that block and moved several hundred, like seven or eight hundred jobs into that building. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, there were restaurants there. There were Mm -hmm. drugstores there. There were shoe stores there. There was a nightlife on the block, which had never been there before. When you put people, working people, into a neighborhood, they They want to have a drink after work. Exactly. They do. They have breakfast. They have guests in. They don't want to drive all over the place. They they move a lot. They want coffee. Right. And the knock-on effect of moving jobs around has a huge effect and really did spark the rehabilitation of that neighborhood. Artists came and moved in. Entrepreneurs mm-hmm. came and moved in. Record stores opened. Jewelry stores opened. It was, and I got to watch it all basically out of my window. But it, it, the same thing happens in reverse. When you take a bunch of jobs out of a neighborhood, the restaurants that serve them and the dry cleaners that serve them and the other services that serve them dry up and blow away. And the most affected neighborhood is the, is the place where you should do that the least. You should do it the other way around. And Springfield, the EPA, whoever was in charge of this, absolutely screwed over that neighborhood. They fucking knew what they were doing, though. Yes, they did. They wanted to be in the mall. We want to be in the mall. They want to be on the white side of town, too. Exactly. Um, and then the reporters made some predictions, which I'll go through very quickly. Uh, first of all, there was like, you remember when this was all going to last for two weeks and we'll stay home, it'll all be okay? I do. And it didn't happen that way. That's over now. And working at home will probably become the norm, especially for people with long commutes, because it works now. Everybody knows it works now. Um, Handshaking is over, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, Unity. Oh, hell no. That's not going to happen. Forget about it. You can talk about it all you want, but it's not going to happen. There will be, as we've talked about on this podcast before, a probably huge pent up demand for shopping and traveling. Uh, It turns out that the science fiction promise of remote learning kind of sucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, face-to-face learning is irreplaceable and teachers are the most important people in the community uh, by far. Period. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Hey, each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is a dog. And this is a dog named Joey. Joey came from a local rescue and is three years old. He, like many of our pets, 
has wonderful powers of healing and comfort and has been a great therapeutic pet to our listener, Anne Marie, during the course of the past year. We're so glad Joey found his forever home, and it looks like he found a job, too, being, you know, therapy. Uh, We're so glad. And uh, not the least reason that we're so happy Joey found his forever home is he now gets a daily dose of freshly poured pet food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store direct, your pets will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Joey. He's a real cutie at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details, both our PayPal, postal address information, Patreon. It's all there at proleftpod.com. We've also got merch. Don't forget merch. And please share our show on social media. And thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Uh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties are still waiting to hear who Biden will nominate as Secretary of Treats and Chin Scratching. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.